thank you all for joining us uh, for the first of two lectures on Napoleon in the run-up to the bicentenary of his death on the 5th of May. We are delighted to have with us this evening Philip Mansell. Philip is a historian of courts and cities and of France and the Ottoman Empire. His first book, Louis XVIII, was published in 1981 and along with subsequent works established him as a specialist on the later French monarchy. As well as having published some 14 books, seven of which have been translated into French, he has also contributed to numerous newspapers and journals and has lectured in many countries across the world. In 1995, he co-founded the Society for Court Studies, um, designed to promote research into the field of court history, and he was the editor of the Society's journal until 2016. In 2015, his book on Napoleon and his court, entitled The Eagle in Splendour, was republished. The book offers a fresh uh, perspective on Napoleon, showing this most famous of historical figures, not first and foremost as a great military leader, but above all as a monarch. And it is on this theme that Philip will speak to us this evening. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. I'm delighted to, I wish I could be with you in the flesh. And anyway, we're talking on Zoom tonight on Napoleon as emperor and king, a man who really rebranded monarchy for the 19th century. This is a picture by Duplessis Berthaud of the fall of the Tuileries Palace, the 10th of August, 1792. Louis XVI then runs away to the Legislative Assembly and he is later guillotined like his wife, Marie Antoinette in 1793. And this appeared to have established the French Republic. It, see, it thought it was going to be eternal, but in reality, it was just a, an interlude caused by the failures of Louis XVI and his ministers and the radicalism of the revolutionaries. Really, France remained then as now quite a monarchical society. And in 1799, a young general just back from Egypt began to fill the gap with his military coup d'etat, the coup d'etat of Brumaire. He fulfilled the prophecy of the great counter-revolutionary writer Rivarol in 1790, when he had written, either the king will have an army or the army will have a king. And my goodness, the army found a king. This is a drawing by Isabey, one of the great court artists of the time, who will be following through this talk. And this shows General Bonaparte on a white horse. And it is said that the white horse had belonged to Louis XVI. And he is reviewing his guard, the Garde des Consuls, in the courtyard of the Tuileries, the same courtyard we have just seen uh, the revolutionary attack on the palace. And here is Marshal Bessières, who later is one of the colonels of the Imperial Guard. And troops are what founded his power. He has a weekly review of the guard in the courtyard of the Tuileries. And according to one English visitor, the guard's presence in Paris alone maintains public tranquility and causes a sensation. In reality, he had restored law and order and he already inspired fear. The main difference between his monarchy and the, mon and the Bourbon monarchy is that the Bonaparte monarchy was always a military monarchy founded on the army. And he also moves into the Tuileries Palace to live there. And the Abbe Sies, who had been a revolutionary, says maybe the palace's memories of Louis, Louis XVI and his downfall would alarm Bonaparte, to which Bonaparte replied, if I was Louis XVI, I would still be Louis XVI. And if I was a priest, as Sies had been, I would still be a priest. 
that is a dig at the former revolutionary and in fact an announcement of the kind of regime Bonaparte was going to make based on religion and on monarchy. So 1800 to 1804, Bonaparte introduces a new constitution with a Senate, a Tribunate and a Corps Legislatif. He begins some brilliant reforms of the French finances as a result of which even if when France was defeated, the finances remained in a healthy state. He establishes the Banque de France. He begins preparing for the Code Civil, the Code Napoleon. But at the same time, he is creating a court in the Tuileries Palace. He holds weekly receptions and rank was confirmed by space, not time, by which room in the State Department you were admitted to, i.e. the higher your rank, the grander the room to which you were admitted, not as at Versailles, by what time you were admitted to the King's bedroom. And already by 1802, a Swede, Count Armfeldt, who had seen Versailles before the revolution, wrote, none of the levees of the European courts can vie in splendor with those of the chief consul. Court dress was obligatory for people without an official position. Bonaparte brought in extraordinarily elaborate and expensive uniforms, embroidered uniforms, and sometimes the government paid for their cost. And this print is of the Comte de Ségur, a courtier of Louis XVI, who had been his ambassador to Catherine the Great, and he is an early courtier of Bonaparte. He becomes Grand Master of Ceremonies of the Imperial Court. He it is who devises and records the etiquette of the Imperial Palace. And Madame de Stael, a liberal writer, an enemy of Napoleon, said that his book, Etiquette du Palais Imperial, showed just how low the human spirit could descend. And finally, in 1804, imperial households were established for Napoleon, for his wife, the Empress Josephine, for all his family. And this is a beautiful print by Isabelle, helped by Percier and Fontaine, the Emperor's main architects, which shows Madame du, de Remusat as a lady in waiting to Josephine, holding a part of the offerings at the coronation in December 1804. There is a fully fledged monarchy in France by 1804, only 12 years after the abolition of the monarchy of Louis XVI. Monarchy is back and he imposes monarchy throughout Europe. This is often forgotten. He establishes his brothers on the thrones of Lucca, Holland, Naples, Westphalia and Spain. And above all, he abolishes republics. It, Bonaparte is the man who destroyed Venice and the Venetian Republic in 1797. Later, Genoa, Luca, Dubrovnik, Holland, everywhere in Europe, republics are abolished. Even Switzerland becomes a confederation of which Bonaparte is mediator. So there has never been a more monarchical century than the 19th century. And at the same time as he's abolishing republics, putting his brothers or brothers-in-law on other thrones, he makes 1806 the electors of Saxony and Bavaria and Württemberg kings. So there are more kingdoms in Germany than ever before. And here you see a marvelous picture by Gérard, one of the great um, painters of the time, showing General Rapp bringing the news of the victory of Austerlitz to Napoleon. And he is shown calmly, always on a white horse, and he's bringing uh, conquered enemy flags and enemy prisoners. This picture was on the roof of the Salle du Conseil d'État, the meeting room of the Council of State in the Tuileries Palace. Gradually, all the 
decoration of the Tuileries Palace was covered in pictures glorifying the emperor and the letter N for Napoleon was everywhere and the B, the symbol of his dynasty was everywhere. And here is his chief advisor, General Duroc, who is made Duc de Frioul, and he's wearing the elaborate uniform of Grand Maréchal du Palais, the man who's really running the court, controlling expenditure, a key figure in Bonaparte's life, his closest confidant. And please note that he has red heels on his buckled shoes, red heels with a symbol of the courtier of Versailles, which Napoleon brings back. And the sash, the cloak, that's all new. It, the courtiers of Versailles had not worn them. So court dress is becoming more elaborate. Huge orders are placed with the silk industry of Lyon, which may explain why Lyon remained a citadel of Bonapartism. And the Grand Chamberlain is another official connected to the court of Louis XVI. He's Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Perigord, Prince de Benevent. He's wearing the scarlet color of the service of the Grand Chamberlain. And his mother had been a lady in waiting of Marie Antoinette. So he knew the court from the inside and he and Ségur probably helped Napoleon set up his court and dynasty. Unfortunately, there are no records of the meetings of why they chose certain aspects of the court. And here is Talleyrand's niece, the Duchesse de Dino, who becomes a lady in waiting of the Empress. Of the ladies at the Napoleonic court, Stendhal, the great French novelist, who was a an official in the furniture department, he got very excited about their beauty and he constantly praised them in his writings. It's by Prudhon, another of the great portraitists of the time. And this is 1807. It's um, December 1807. There is a regatta in Venice in honor of Napoleon's visit. This is by Borsato. It's in the Risorgimento Museum in Milan. And he's not only creating monarchies all over Europe, he's also creating royal palaces. And a wing of the, of the main square of Venice is a, became a royal palace for Napoleon as King of Italy. He's not just Emperor of the French, he's King of Italy, crowned in Milan with the Iron Crown of Lombardy in 1805. And the decor of the Royal Palace, the, which is now the Museo Correa, is one of the best empire decors I have seen. You should admire the staircase. And here is a picture by Benvenuti. Most of these pictures are in the Museum of the History of France in the Palace of Versailles and the Empire Rooms are usually open at the same time as the rest of the palace. And this shows his sister Eliza as Grand Duchess of Tuscany. Here is the Duomo of Florence. And it's the only picture I know of which shows an entire court more or less in action. You see her ladies in waiting. You see the engraver of her pictures called Mr. Santelli who's going to publicize her. This is Monsieur Daly Alessandri, who is the Grand Chamberlain, wearing the red color associated with the service of the Grand Chamberlain. Here is Eliza herself. Here is her lover, Bartolomeo Cenami, who's also head of her stables, Grand Equier, master of the horse. Her daughter, Napolina, who died young, everybody had to be called Napoleon or Napolina in his family. And two artists at work, Benvenuti himself and Fabre, another artist of the time who lived in Florence. 
So you see them preparing their portraits of the Grand Duchess. And it's during a visit by the great sculptor Canova, the far the greatest sculptor of the time, who is formerly first sculptor of the emperor, who in fact mass produces from Carrara statues of Napoleon. And here is a bust of Eliza herself. Here is her rather feeble husband, Felix Bacchiocchi, who called himself Felix I, Prince of Piombino and Prince of Luca. This is the grandmaster of the court, Lucchesini, who had been a, an ambassador of Frederick the Great and officers of the guard. But this Eliza's regime in Tuscany collapsed as rapidly as all the other Bonaparte regimes in Europe, including Napoleon's own. It did not put down roots. And here is her chief musician, may have been one of her boyfriends, Paganini, known as the Emperor of the Violin, who composed many pieces of music in honor of the Bonapartes. And it's not just Florence and Venice that become uh, capitals with royal palaces. Here is Amsterdam by Van Bray. Napoleon annexed it in 1810. Previously, um, his brother Louis had been King of Holland, but for a few years, Holland becomes French with departments exactly like France. This is the former town hall of Amsterdam, a symbol of municipal power and wealth and independence, which under Napoleon becomes a royal palace as it still is to this day. It still re also retains some of its empire furniture. This is Napoleon visiting Amsterdam in 1811 with his wife, the Empress Marie-Louise. And although he was cheered, in fact, it was the nadir of Dutch economic performance. There were almost no ships in the port of Amsterdam, which in the 18th century had been one of the leading ports in the world. And here is one of his Italian officials, Fontanelli, Minister of War of the Kingdom of Italy by Andrea Appiani, just to show you that these extraordinary Napoleonic uniforms spread everywhere, Italy as well as France. And here is on the left is the uniform of Count Roederer as Councillor of State in black. And on the right is the grand uniform of Count Bertrand, who replaces Duroc, Duc de Frioul, as Grand Maréchal du Palais, Great Marshal of the Palace, in 1813, when Duroc is killed in battle, as was a risk if you're a Napoleonic court official or general. And I wonder if Bertrand ever actually wore this, because by the time he is Grand Marshal of the Palace, the regime is tottering to its fall and he may have worn it briefly in 1815, but this is one of the many wonderful costumes in the collection of the Fondation Napoleon in Paris, which is organizing a, a round of exhibitions and talks. You should go on their website because there are about five apparently wonderful exhibitions in Paris alone. There's also one in Corsica, one in Switzerland on Napoleon to commemorate the 200th anniversary of his death. And the fact that Bertrand, who is not a noble, becomes Grand Marshal of the Palace is confirmation that although the nobility became more important under Napoleon, there was always a career open to the talents. That was in fact one of the foundations of his regime, as well as his constant victories and exhaustion with the revolution. And here is a court dress of a wife of a council of state attending the coronation in 1804. It's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Again, the amount of work from embroiderers as well as dressmakers was colossal. This would have put a lot of money back into the French economy. And again, many officials got grants from the emperor to help pay for their costumes. And this is a 
costume of the Empress Josephine, particularly graceful. She added grace to the regime. She was popular. She pleaded for mercy for, for Napoleon's political opponents. And this costume is in Malmaison, her house outside Paris, which is really a shrine to the empire with a lot of jewels, furniture, and costumes. That is a costume of Napoleon's mother, Madame Mère, more elaborate. I'm sorry for the quality of the slide. And that is in the Museo Napoleonico in Rome, another shrine to the empire. It's very well explained and displayed, including documents, as well as costumes and furniture. 1807, this is by Regno. It's the marriage of Napoleon's youngest brother, Jerome, who's in front of us, to Princess Catherine of Württemberg. Uh, Jerome is the ancestor of the present surviving Bonapartes. And the whole family is there. It's, it's not exact, not in fact reality, because they weren't all together, but all his sisters and sisters-in-law are on the right, or on the left, rather, and his brothers are here, Joseph uh, and Jerome and, and Louis, and his stepson, Eugène, Josephine's son by her first marriage. And these are the full court dress of Napoleon, personally devised by him, heavily embroidered, and with more feathers in his hat than Marie Antoinette had ever worn. There they are again. That is Jerome in front of his palace of Wilhelmshöhe, the main palace in Hesse Castle. He was king of Westphalia. It was rebaptized inevitably Napoleonshöhe in his reign. He was not particularly popular, and the king, kingdom of Westphalia only lasted five years. And in the conquered regions of Europe, the main question people asked about the Napoleonic regime is, will it last? It wasn't the benefits of the Code Civil or the crushing taxation, the terrifying conscription known as the, the blood tax, the conscription, the deaths in the endless wars of which Madame de Noailles said the regime was like the guillotine in permanence. The main doubt in people's minds was the durability of the regime and in France, itself. This is Napoleon's brother, elder brother Joseph, painted by Gérard again as King of Spain. These are fantasy robes. He never actually wore them. And he was hated in Spain. El Rey Intruso, he was called. And there are so many Spanish pictures in Apsley House in London, because Wellington conquered them from him in 1813, as he was stealing, in fact, the Spanish crown jewels and pictures from Madrid and trying to take them back to France as he retreated. And Napoleon was particularly concerned with monarchical splendor and formality. This is a design by his court architects, Percier and Fontaine, for his throne. And as you will see, this was copied in many of, this was in fact put into practice in many of his palaces. Here is a picture of the throne room in the Tuileries Palace, the Tuileries which we saw at the beginning of this talk. Here is Bessier as Colonel General of the Imperial Guard. This is Cambacérès, Arch-Chancellor of the Empire thanks to whom he was homosexual and he ensured that the Code Civil did not criminalize homosexuality. This is Cardinal Fesch, half uncle of Napoleon, who in the end turned against him and supported the Pope in his struggles with Napoleon. This is Talleyrand, this is King Jerome, and this is the Comte de Ségur as Grand Master of Ceremonies of the court. And he's introducing a group of Roman nobles who are, quote, offering, unquote, the sovereignty of Rome to Napoleon. 
most unwillingly, the Pope has been kidnapped and taken to prison, first in Savona and later in Fontainebleau. And please note that they're wearing embroidered court dress, almost the same as before 1789 at the court of Louis XVI and other European courts. The only difference is that the collar is slightly higher. So anticipating George Orwell's animal, animal farms, where the animals see that the pigs end up wearing the same clothes as the farmers, the ex-revolutionaries who supported Napoleon ended up more or less wearing the same clothes as the former courtiers and nobles of the reign of Louis XVI. This picture is by Gubo. It's in the Museum of Versailles. And here is a key figure in the regime, Baron Denon. He had been a gentilhomme ordinaire du roi under Louis XV and Louis XVI. He also knew Versailles, but he supported totally Napoleon. And in fact, he is the main image maker of the regime. He runs the Louvre. He directs the medals, the, organizes the coins and medals of the regime. He's the chief propagandist, in fact. And it's he who goes around Europe behind Napoleon's armies, choosing works of art to adorn the walls of the Louvre and the many arches erected in Paris. In fact, he's the looter in chief of the regime. Here you see the creation of the column in the Place Vendôme with Napoleon as Roman emperor at the top. And the column is partly made from the melted down cannon taken from the enemy at the Battle of Austerlitz. It replaces a statue of Louis XIV. And here you see, this is Vienna by Benjamin Zix. And you see the large quantities of bales or packages being crated up before being taken from Vienna to Paris, 1809. Uh, Austria has been defeated for the third time by Napoleon at Wagram. And here you see another picture by Benjamin Zix, Napoleon and Marie-Louise visiting the room of Leocorn at night. It was thought that you saw statues better at night and Leocorn has been taken from the Vatican Museum. All the museums of conquered territories were looted by Napoleon. And in fact, there's much discussion now about violated national heritage in many different countries. Well, nobody violated more national heritages than Napoleon, not just works of art, but also archives were taken from Simancas or Venice or Rome to Paris. They were mainly returned in 1815, but of course, many got lost on the way. And you see here an exhibition in the Louvre of the works of art conquered in Germany. And Parisians were delighted to have all these works of art on the walls of their beloved Louvre and were extremely angry when they weren't removed in 1814 when Napoleon fell, but only in 1815 after the Hundred Days. And here are two of the main court officials of the regime. Again, links between the old regime and Napoleon. They're by Regnault, they're in Versailles. On the left is the Comte de Colincourt, who is Grand Equier or Master of the Horse to Napoleon. He's in the blue uniform, the blue color of the service of the Ecurie. He wrote wonderful memoirs, which I recommend to all of you, which particularly describe flying back from Moscow in a sleigh with Napoleon in December 1812 and the conversations they had. And in fact, he becomes a minister. He also becomes ambassador to Russia. He's a key observer, very good writer, an honorable man who wanted to moderate Napoleon's folly de grandeur and expansionism, but failed. And he fell with the regime 
1815. He was never employed again. And in green on the right is Napoleon's chief of staff, a brilliant general called Marshal Berthier. And he's pointing to a map or a decree about the forests round Paris. And this map had been started by his father, who is a forest official of Louis XV. And he finished it in 1807 as Grand Veneur or Chief Huntsman of Napoleon. So he's very proud of it. He is another example of continuity. The empire was employing the minor officials of the old regime. And in fact, Napoleon revives the hunt, often with some of the huntsmen of Louis XVI. And here is a picture by Vernet of Napoleon at a hunt. It's in the Musée de la Chasse in Senlis. He's being watched by his second wife, Marie-Louise, and he is finishing off the deer, which has been caught by the hounds of the imperial hunt. His hunt had about 100 officials. Um, it was smaller and cheaper than Louis XVI, but the tradition of the French court hunting, going to Fontainebleau for the hunting season, because hunting was better there than anywhere else, he revived all that. It became a hunting court again, with the entire court and part of the government moving in the autumn to Fontainebleau. Uh, here is the Duchess de Bassano, another lady-in-waiting of the Empress. Her husband, Marais Duc de Bassano, was head of the Secretariat d'État, or Napoleon's private secretariat, which was part of his household, separate from, and in the end, more powerful than the official government of the state, really an alternative government with its own treasury. Here is Madame Riesner, by, by, painted by her husband Riesner. She is one of the women of the chamber of the Empress. And 1809, this is a picture of Napoleon's beautiful sister, Princess Pauline, on the left, with Madame de Matisse, Christine de Matisse, on the right. And I think this picture of a subject with a princess commemorates Pauline's success in making Christine de Matisse a mistress of the emperor and then she later has an illegitimate child by him and this is part of the Bonaparte's campaign to get rid of Josephine who has no children by the emperor and get a new empress. She's proven to Napoleon that he can have children and here he is this is his engagement picture which he sends to Vienna to the Archduchess Marie-Louise who the Emperor of Austria is happy to marry to Napoleon because he hopes he will get better terms since he's been defeated yet again at Wagram. Please note Napoleon's love of elaborate costumes. <clears throat> and here is the wedding of Napoleon and Marie-Louise in the Louvre. The Louvre reverts briefly to its role as a royal palace. 18, 1810, it is the apogee of the empire. It seems nothing can resist him. And it's also an apogee of court life. This is Napoleon and Marie-Louise's entry into Paris from Saint-Cloud. And here they are inaugurating and processing down the Grande Galerie of the Louvre, which many of you will know. And the pictures lining it are some of the pictures taken from Antwerp, Amsterdam, Milan, Venice, and so on, all hung by Baron Denon. 4,000 Parisians cheer as the Emperor and Empress proceed. And here is the inevitable Comte de Ségur, again, Grand Master of Ceremonies. Here they are again with some of the pictures taken from Europe. But there's one mocking Austrian observer called Count Clary, 
and he laughed at the Empress's procession, which he compared to a slowly advancing tortoise, because Napoleon had insisted that his sisters and sisters-in-law bear the Empress's train, and they deeply resented this slight on their recently acquired imperial rank. And there it is drawn by Count Clary. He wrote a wonderful little book called Three Months in Paris, describing the festivities. And here they are on the throne in the Tuileries Palace that you've seen before, receiving the homage of officials. And here, facing the Tuileries Garden from the Tuileries Palace, receiving the homage of the soldiers of the army, a reminder that the army was the chief support of the empire. And that evening, this is 2nd of April, 1810, there is a grand couvert or a banquet in public in the theater of the Tuileries Palace. And so N Napoleon and his wife are dining in public with their family, watched by members of the court. You, you see the audience here. And this is the assembled imperial family. And here are some of the really extraordinarily elaborate gold and silver ordered from Tomir and Bienne by Napoleon. And he's reintroducing grandeur and formality into court life. And this is copied in Austria, Russia, and even in England, because 1805, a year after Napoleon's coronation, is when George III reintroduces an elaborate Garter Day ceremony at Windsor. And of course, 1811, the regent becomes regent and he inaugurates his regency with an elaborate party banquet and reception which was one of the grandest events in the history of the English court. And probably, although they never admitted it, they are competing with Napoleon. 1811, everything seems to be going well. This is a drawing by Isabelle, who has a formal position at court. And this shows Napoleon, the birth of Napoleon's son, who is called King of Rome. This is the bedroom of the Empress. Here is her chief lady in waiting, the Duchesse de Montebello. And here is the governess of Napoleon's son, Madame de Montescu, chosen from the old nobility, the old court nobility, and given the traditional French court title of Gouvernante des Enfants de France. And 1810 to 18. 12 or 13, Napoleon goes to mass regularly. He holds um, lots of theater performances at court. He goes hunting regularly. He's really doing traditional court things and giving a, a, a lot of money to his courtiers as the kings of France had done. Here is the cradle of the King of Rome, now in Vienna. Here is a throne room in the Palace of Fontainebleau, uh, installed in 1804 to 1808. Fontainebleau has retained many of, much of its empire furniture. And you see the tabouret, the traditional stool associated with Versailles is used by Napoleon. And one, guest in a wing of Fontainebleau was the Pope who is imprisoned. He will not agree to some of Napoleon's measures. And Napoleon is so angry that in January 1813, when he's visiting the Pope, he actually physically shakes him. So probably the only time a Pope recently has been physically assaulted, but it did not end the Pope's opposition to his attempted church reforms. Here is a library at Compiègne, the palace north of Paris, which also still retains many empire interiors. The ceiling is by Giraudet. And here is the Empress's bedroom at Compiègne, 
with its furniture. And her salon de compagnie. Chairs were for members of the imperial family, tabouret for all the others. And I'll just show you some of the porcelain, the empire porcelain created at Sevres, the imperial factory, which Napoleon used as lavishly as any Bourbon. Here is a plate showing the Tuileries Palace and Tuileries Gardens and the Rue de Rivoli, which is being created under Napoleon. A, an ice pail given by Napoleon to his father-in-law, the Emperor of Austria, also showing the Tuileries Palace. You can now see it in the British Museum. A set showing different members of the imperial family. On the right, the Empress Josephine, Napoleon, of course, his stepdaughter, Queen Hortense, his son, the King of Rome, his sister, the Queen of Naples. And the Table des Grands Capitaines, a masterpiece of Sèvres, which was later given by Louis XVIII to the Prince Regent and is now in Buckingham Palace, uh, a trophy of victory for the House of Hanover. That is the top of the table, much used by George IV in his portraits by Lawrence. And there is another table, of, of the table of the marshals, which is in a private collection. No, I think it's a, sorry, I think it's a Malmaison. And here is another court costume of Marshal Berthier. They're no longer at court ceremonies wearing uniforms. They are wearing this abbey abbé, as it was called, like the courtiers of Louis the 16th. And here is a project by Napoleon's architects, Percier and Fontaine, for a palace for the King of Rome on the hill of Chaillot, where the Trocadero now is. The facade of constitutional government with a Senate, a corps législatif, is more or less meaningless. In fact, it's the emperor at his court controlling everything. But events change, events turn against him. Here is a picture by Faber Dufour showing Napoleon during the retreat from Moscow. There is an attempted coup in Paris against him by General Mallet. And gradually, the German princes, the King of Prussia, the Emperor of Austria, league against him as he becomes weaker. And discontent rears its head in France itself. Here is the Tuileries Palace looking very peaceful and serene by Bouo. The picture is in the Musée Carnavalet. And I think this is the Empress going for a drive escorted by the Imperial Guard. This is Montmartre lined with uh, mills, hence the Moulin Rouge. And this is one of Napoleon's enemies one of the cleverest of them all, also like him, a Corsican, forgotten now, but famous in his time, called Count Pozzo di Borgo. And he becomes an aide-de-camp of Alexander I, Napoleon's most powerful enemy. And he helps league him with the Bourbons and with the Prince Regent in England. He's everywhere weaving a web of alliance against Napoleon. Uh, discontent is rife. Even the corps législatif turns against Napoleon. January 1814, when it asks for peace, he denounces it at a reception in the Tuileries. He declares, everything resides in the throne. I alone represent the people. But this was just an illusion, a delusion. In fact, Paris had turned against him. In fact, his armies were defeated. This is the entry of the Allied monarchs into Paris on the 31st of March, 1814. And you see they are being applauded, particularly by the women who know that the sons, brothers and husbands will no longer die in warfare. This is a piece, a 
particularly overtly a European peace. They are talking about the peace of Europe. And just to quote you, some of the anti-Napoleon literature then published the Corps Municipal of Paris launches a denunciation even before Napoleon has abdicated, which is very brave. And it says, what good have these fatal victories done to us? They've merely brought us the hatred of the peoples and the tears of families. And here is Alexander I, very popular in Paris, possibly more cheered than Napoleon himself by Gérard. And here is the master of events, Talleyrand, who Napoleon had turned against. He called him a lump of shit in a silk stocking. And Talleyrand got his revenge because he masterminds the deposition of Napoleon and the return of the Bourbons in April 1814. Above all, to have peace in Europe because Napoleon could not live without war. And everything worked smoothly. Everything had in fact been prepared long in advance. Here is a mass uniting the Russian, Austrian and Prussian armies on the Place de la Concorde in April 1814, showing to Paris the power of the European coalition against Napoleon. Here is his, one of the most famous pictures of a historical event um, by Horace Vernet. Napoleon bids farewell to the Imperial Guard in the courtyard of Fontainebleau, 20th of April, 1814. Behind him is the Duc de Bassano, who had really been his chief secretary in his court. And he foolishly does not secure the person of his, the key trump cards in the dynastic game then being played, his wife, Marie-Louise, and his son, the King of Rome. He allows them to go to Vienna as he himself is retreating to Elba. And here is the Empress's chief lady in waiting, the Duchesse de Montebello, who disliked Napoleon and may have turned Marie-Louise against him by Baron Gérard. 24th of April, 1814, as Napoleon is going to Elba, Louis XVIII is returning to Paris. Here he is saying goodbye to the Prince Regent on the royal yacht in the harbor of Dover. There'd been a triumphal reception in London. They swear eternal peace and friendship between France and England. Here he is entering Paris on the 3rd of May, 1814. For a time, the restored Bourbons, because they brought back peace and trade, were qu quite popular, at least with half of France. Here is the print by Isabelle of the Congress of Vienna, settling the peace of Europe. This, this is the original drawing for the print bought by the Prince Regent, who was a great European. 20th of March, 1815, Napoleon returns in triumph, the beginning of the Hundred Days, but in fact, it is partly a military triumph. You see the soldiers form most of the crowd, and at the head of the staircase, the court and the ladies of the court are waiting for his return. It was said it seemed that he had only been away for a brief voyage to one of his palaces. Count Carnot, here in court dress, although he was really a Republican, is the Emperor's Minister of the Interior, but the regime only has half the support of France. And of course, inevitably, the French army is defeated by the coalition European army at Waterloo. And Napoleon is taken to St. Helena, where he would die 200 years ago. Here he is dictating his memoirs to Baron Gorgo. And really his ultimate, his chief victory in some ways was the way he reshaped his reputation on St. Helena, no longer the imperial autocrat loving war, 
imprisoning all his opponents, ruling far more ruthlessly than the Tsar of Russia or the Bourbon kings. He makes himself into a liberal hero and uh, uh, the friend of the people, which he really wasn't. And I would like to... Con Here he is dying in May 1821 on St. Helena, a small court with him. But his reputation lived on as people forgot the horrors of the war, the wars that he had launched. They remembered the splendor of his court. This is a picture by Debray of the Napoleonic style coronation of the first emperor of Brazil, Pedro I, in 1822. And his empress, his wife, was in fact a sister of Marie-Louise called Leopoldina. And here is Napoleon's stepdaughter, Queen Hortense, who kept alive the memory of the empire. And it is her son, Napoleon III, who returns in triumph as emperor in 1852. But I would like to conclude with these words of Joseph Conrad on Napoleon. The Napoleonic legend was in fact a legend. And Conrad wrote in 1906, the degradation of the ideas of freedom and justice at the root of the French Revolution is made manifest in the person of its heir, a personality without law or faith, whom it has been the fashion to represent as an eagle, but who is in truth more like a vulture, preying upon the body of a Europe, which did indeed for some dozen of years resemble very much a corpse, the subtle and manifold influence for evil of the Napoleonic episode as a school of violence, as a sower of national hatreds, as the direct provoker of obscurantism and reaction, of political and tyranny and injustice cannot well be exaggerated. Thank you very much.